and my wife and I were getting ready yesterday and she asked what we had going, what I had going today. And I said, well, I've got a prep call for a practice management uh, deal that we're doing tomorrow with my buddy, Randy. And she said, is practice management the favorite thing, your favorite thing that you do? And I paused for a second and I said, it is. I think this is the most dynamic uh, area. It's the area that we can have the biggest impact, I think. And I have been so fortunate and grateful to be able to work with my friend Randy Fuss of CUNA Mutual for a number of years now. He is the absolute expert in this field, and he has been gracious to share the wisdom that he has with us through the years. And today is going to have a number of topics that we have covered in disparate uh, settings through the years. Uh, just kind of the highlights, the, uh, the ones that are most asked about that we're going to be chatting about today. And anything that CUNA says that you would like to go deeper on or you would like to discuss further, you're welcome to reach out to me and uh, we'll have a conversation. But ultimately, I'm going to put you in touch with Randy's team because they have all been highly trained on this content and would love to work more with you on that. So with that, Randy, thank you for being with us today. What, uh, what you got cooking? Good looking. Well, first of all, happy Valentine's Day. I, I've, I've got to share with really? you. Really? I didn't know. Uh, I don't know if, if I can uh, relate with anybody on the call right now, but that would be when it's February 13th and you wake up and realize that you've actually not made any plans yet. I'm not saying it's ever happened to anybody else. But if that is the case, such it was with me yours truly yesterday, it means that you had your dinner reservation at 430 because all they had left was the 430 or the 930, which is way too late. No, I, I share that with you because uh, obviously you've all heard of the you know, Ben Franklin quote of, you know, failing to plan, you are planning to fail. And I share that because practice management to a large degree is about planning, right? To a very large extent it is about, you know, being proactive with your practice, identifying some areas that need improvement and trying to, to build on it. And hopefully that's what we can do with you today to spend a little bit of time working on a few things. So we've got a, a really interesting dynamic today because uh, Jeff actually is our sous chef and we're putting together an actual Valentine's Day menu for you, right? So I, I'm really excited about this. Why don't you kind of share what's on our menu today, Jeff? Well, we're going to be taking a look at the things that cause us problems without us realizing that they're causing us problems. Uh, we are going to be talking about how to uh, stay on task. I hear Luke Skywalker's words in my head saying, stay on target, stay on target. And we are going to look at some of the metrics that Randy has built uh, over time on how to put pen to paper and actually measure what you're doing now, plan to where you want to be, and make a roadmap on how to get there. Terrific. Well, to get us started, it's kind of interesting because the uh, the invitation actually used the word appetizer, uh, entree, and dessert, right? So for for an for for an appetizer, it's not really going to sound very appealing. But we want to discuss a couple of roadblocks, and we'll get to some tools that are really kind of the main course and the road to profitability, which is the dessert. But I want to kind of share with you a common roadblock, and this is something that uh, Jeff and I both play in a practice management role, and we have lots of conversations with you. And I just got to ask you, if, if, if the audience, have you ever had one of those days where you got near the end of the day and you kind of reflect upon it? You go, like, I didn't get anything accomplished today, right? It was nothing but emails, phone calls, all of course unplanned, text, uh, pop up messages you're getting. By the way, maybe it was, maybe it was yesterday when the Russell 2000 dropped four percent, and you were thinking about that small cap fund you have in some of your fund lineups, wondering how it did relative to. The volatility in the market. You know, you got the coworker that's knocking with a quick question. Yeah, right, quick question. And all those service issues happening. And if you combine all that together, those are the work distractions. There might be one or two things that are going on at home. Right now, I know that the COVID work at home was one thing where you're balancing a thousand different things at the same time, but 30% of the workforce is still remote. Right. So there's going to be distractions. And if you're not working at home, one of your coworkers might. And it could be that you're relying upon them for something and they're not available because of distractions they're having. 
So Jeff, I've got to ask you, this sounds like kind of a, a classic time management issue. Is that is that really the only issue we're looking at here? It's a prioritization issue, Randy. Uh, there are the things that we have to get done, and those are the things that we typically do get done. But the have to get done's don't typically take our full eight hours or 10 hours or 12 hours, uh, however long we're working. There are gaps in there, but then how do we fill those gaps? And to just emphasize your point about the distractions, I had muted my phone before we started, but as soon as we got started, I realized my watch was buzzing on my wrist and it was creating a distraction. And I was wondering, well, I wonder why my watch is buzzing on my wrist. So I just took it off and chunked it while you were chatting to keep that from being a distraction moving forward. But yeah, what do we do in between the times that of the things that just have to be done right now or there are immediate negative consequences? You know, I want to throw through the kind of build on that a little bit because it is focus, not time, right? It is that prioritization. And unfortunately, with all the things I listed out, they, they're like a screaming siren alarm that's going off 24-7. And what tends to happen is you knock out all those things, and now you're sitting at 3, 3.30 p.m. going, okay, now I can get to that important stuff. And I want, I want to give you an, an acronym, if you don't mind. It's CDA. And what CDA stands for is Cognitively Demanding Activities, right? These are the activities that require brain, brain power. And unfortunately, if you're just getting worn down and now you get to the important step at 3.30, it's quite likely that your focus is, is not there anymore, right? It's, it's already shot. So Jeff, to your point of being able to slot some time throughout the day to say, you know what, I've got to take care of some CDAs. I have to take care of some demanding things that I've got to figure out how to stop the sirens even for 30, 60 minutes. Uh, I did want to introduce a, a gentleman named Brian Margolis. He wrote a book called The Index Card Business Plan. And the book is a very novel approach that by focusing on less, you can actually have better results. And he refers to them as pillars. We're going to just touch upon pillars a little bit later on. But really, the whole thought process behind it is trying to find those things that are going to create the biggest impact to your practice. All right. So again, from a focus standpoint, Jeff, I'd, I'd love to hear from you because we're going to get into the tools. Um, and, and one of the greatest focuses is, is something called a, a billable hourly rate. And, and Jeff, I just got to ask you, what the heck is that? And why might it be, be important to the folks that are on the line today? Sure. Well, if anyone has ever hired legal services, they're probably pretty familiar with what the billable hourly rate is, because that's what your legal representative is going to charge you not for the job that is done, but for how much time that they are required to help you and provide service to you, whether that is uh, doing research, whether that is chatting with you on, a, on the phone, whether that is helping fill out documents, they're charging, there's a meter running like a taxi cab every time they are working on each particular client. And in the financial services arena, that's not really viewed as a standard. Uh, we are typically viewed as we're going to, a client is going to pay you X to do Y job. And that's fine. But at the end of the day, you still are getting paid X amount of dollars and you're putting Y amount of hours into serving that client. And if you do some very simple division and you've got a, a nice metric here, you can find out what your billable hourly rate is. So you've got one. It's just a matter of A, do you know what it is? And B, are you okay with what it is? Yeah, and I'm gonna throw something at you. I'm just gonna kind of pop through. By the way, we have about four profitability worksheets that either myself or Jeff can get to you. And to really kind of sum up what's on the screen right now is that we've actually put a desirable, um, desired billable hourly, hourly rate of 300, which we can certainly support in our profession. And yet when you do the simple math of how much retirement plan revenue is coming in, and what you're actually making, it might be a fraction of that. Um, so Jeff, I got to stare at that 300 for a second. And I'm just kind of curious from your own standpoint of what you've sort of heard, if that's even a realistic number in that ballpark to be focused on. 
It might even be a little bit low, Randy. And I know that uh, I have heard anecdotally people who have spent quite a bit of time analyzing their time and their practice and their revenue and their expenses. And the general number I hear from people, again, who have really put some time into this is about $350 an hour. And I know that you have some more empirical data to back up what that number might be. But ultimately, it's going to be how much time, or I'm sorry, how much revenue that you're bringing in, what is, if you're the business owner or the practice leader, you know, what is your salary? What is the salary of your team? What are you paying your salespeople? If that's a, a percentage, what is your overhead? And those are all the things that are kind of commonly thought of when you're pulling this in. But one that's very important that sometimes gets overlooked is um, margin for the client. Are you building in 15, 20, 25% for the business, because if you're not, you're not a business owner, you are the most underpaid, overworked, overstressed employee that your company has. And that's not good for you. It's not good for your team. And it's not good for your clients. What do you see on the empirical side? You know, it's actually something pretty similar, you know, from the 300 number, it's supported by uh, Ann Schleck has a report that's called a fee benchmarker. Uh, they call it a recovery rate, but it really kind of amounts to the same thing. And it's in the low 300s. I did want to share, though, that you mentioned profit margin and one of our broker dealer partners, Satera, um, they have a model that's a, a 40, 40, 20. And what those dual 40s represent is 40 percent for overhead, 40 percent for sales folks, right? The kind of the sales revenue. And then the 20 percent is the profit margin. So your your 15, 20, 25 is exactly where we need to be headed. Now, I'm going to spin this a little bit different direction and kind of come right back to you. you we got one thing, which is to try to aim for a desired uh, billable hourly rate. Uh, you, you, I seem to, from a standpoint of looking at each plan individually, I seem to run across the, the number 10,000 quite a bit in terms of a desired minimum at the plan level. You know, what, what are your thoughts about that number or what you've seen? That's pretty common. Uh, it is... It depends on where the practice is in their growth phase, because if you early, if we talk about this when you're early in the, the business or the practices uh, timeline, any revenue is good revenue until you get to the point where you're using all of your time that is available or the team's time. And then at that point, you've just got to start looking at the quality of the revenue. And one of the first steps I see folks taking when they've reached that limit on time, and the only thing you can do is be more efficient, is setting a, a minimum floor because the it's one of those paradoxes in life where you want the big plans, but you get a ton of startups that just fall in your lap, typically, especially early in the, the growth of the business. And you don't want to turn those away, but you can't be spending a ton of time on a plan that's going to provide two or three or five thousand dollars in revenue so a lot of folks just set that as their limit say I, I, randy you've got a great small business i'd love to work with you my fee is going to be a minimum of ten thousand dollars if you'd like to move forward and i'm going to make sure you get that uh, that value out of our relationship but it's got to going to be a minimum of ten thousand and then as the plan grows we can uh we can talk about what that looks like what uh what is your perspective on that you know, I had a very recent conversation for an advisor that you know, admitted that, yeah, I'm, I'm at the small end of the market. I have lots of onesies, twosies in terms of plans. Uh, and this is the second of the four worksheets, profitability worksheets that we have. And these numbers were very real for this, this advisor practice. A good amount of revenue coming in for, from plan business, but a whole lot of plans, mm. right? And so from the actual per plan revenue, it, it was roughly half of what it should be. And we've got some real interesting math that, that calculates out here. It's called the big UG, right? It's it's one of those things that um, it, it's a common trap to run into that early in your your revolution of being a, a, of a plan advisor, you really kind of take what you can get. And there is not necessarily a magic moment in time where you wake up and realize you're you're coming up short. But I think what we've kind of laid out for everyone today is, is two things to really focus in on. And one is, you know, considering having that minimum plan revenue metric, uh, but then backing into some type of a billable hour 
that is getting to a respectable level, which, by the way, is still much lower than most attorneys and accountants out there. Absolutely. So, well, in that $10,000 yeah. at $300 an hour, that's going to give you 30 to 35 hours in a year to profitably serve that client. So uh, and that's something that once you start looking at these numbers, it tends to force you to go back to that five pillar system and find out, OK, how can I be most efficient on my time so I'm not running that what can only be 30 or to 35 hours, how is how am I keeping that from running to 40 and 50 hours? Right, slightly. So I'm going to take a little bit of a left-hand turn. Now that we've kind of discussed metrics and numbers and revenues and hourly rates and get to what's real important, which is activities. Right now, this is uh, also coming directly out of uh, the pillar system, Brian Margolis's book. And activities can really be categorized into th three different um, stages. One of them is the insignificant, right? So there, any any practice, any advisors is going to have those reactive type of activities, uh, and they sometimes could be the loudest. They could be the ones that are screaming in your face, urgent. You have to reply to this now. But at the end of the day, they're not going to produce revenue, right? Now we have this urgent, significant category. Now this is like. Uh, a $20 million plan that's a prospect, and they call up Jeff and they say, hey, Jeff, we think we want to work with you. Are you available at four o'clock today? Now, you're going to probably bail it. Maybe, maybe if your, your kid has a little league game, you're like, I got to go to that meeting, right? But there's this whole other category that's very significant, but there's no immediate consequence if you don't do it, right? There, there is a level of proactivity that needs to go into that. So the good news is that if you take a look at these kind of urgent matters, these um, significant matters, some of them proactive, some of them are urgent, uh, we've actually been able to come up with most of the activities that are considered to be core activities to, to really kind of acquire and service a plan going forward. And just as a simple exercise for all of you, I've, I've got a bunch of core activities, almost 30 of them listed out. And I think if you peruse through these, they do kind of fall into five, six categories. There's some prospecting activities, government plan, governance, certain things you need to do operating the plan, investments, employees, vendor management, employer relationship. Picture for a second where you're spending all of your time. And Jeff, I got to ask you this. Um, we got this one category as I'm doing it myself. We have other categories that staff is helping out. I'm outsourcing. Where do you typically, when you're discussing with advisors, find most of the X's are? Well, again, that's going to depend on where they are in the growth <laughs> phase. But at the beginning and even in the middle, sometimes they're all on the left hand side. Now, the opposite of that is when I speak with someone who has really recognized where their value is to the firm and to the practice. They've been able to build infrastructure in place and whittle these down to the two to five areas that are where they are uniquely positioned to add value to clients and to the firm and everything else they've pushed to the right to one of those other three columns. Terrific. And just by the way, I, I know some of the, the print is a little bit light here, but this, this first category is saying I'm doing it myself. And I just got to share with you to state Captain Obvious here that at a certain point, you're going to you're going to hit a capacity, right? It might only be 10, 15 plans that if you're trying to do everything for that plan, you're going to have a very finite amount of plans before all of a sudden you're going like, I, I can't handle anymore, right? So just working harder and spending more hours is the only way out. And even that has limitation. What we have to the right of it is, you know, to what extent can a, some duties be delegated to staff? And they're somewhat similar, but we're saying outsourcing or partnership, right? They're both kind of the same thing. It just sort of depends on if you are, you know, physically paying a fee for a 316, that might be something you're outsourcing. Or give me some examples of partnership uh, when it comes to relationship management, when it comes to employee education, uh, a, lot, a lot, if not most of your retirement plan uh, vendors are going to have those type of support services that a partnership can be formed. And we're gonna to get to this in a little bit more detail. 
Uh, on the other category, practice management is an important one of that. And Cuno would love to uh, to partner with you on developing your internal practice management. And another component of this, Randy, is I, I typically will in, encourage folks to have a, a grown-up conversation with themselves in the mirror. And when you've identified the items in that list that you think, this is really where I'm adding my value, the next item is to have that that grown up conversation with yourself and decide are these things that really that I'm good at that I can um, uniquely add value that nobody else can or are these things that I just I really like and it's okay if you choose to keep the things that you really like doing but the reality is for the health of the practice if it's something that somebody else if you say you do it at a 10 but either somebody on your team or one of these other two categories could do it at a a 7 and you don't outsource that you may enjoy it. God bless you. It's America. Do it. But know that that's not the decision that's in the best interest of the health of your practice. Precisely. Now we're going to walk back to the roadblock one more time and, and give you kind of a very realistic situation. And that's a situation where you don't have that that minimum 10,000 put into place. Right. So, again, this is just the simplest, simplest of math. You know, let's suppose this is a, a million dollar plan, million and a half dollar plan. Heck, maybe it's a startup that you're going to charge a flat fee, but you're you're coming in a little bit lower than ten thousand. Well, at three hundred dollars an hour, you only got twenty hours to work with. And think about all those activities we just discussed. Is is it even humanly possible to do all those things with twenty hours? And the answer is not, right? But these things still need to be done. So it does kind of beg the question: What gives? What are to Jeff's point? What are the things that you feel compelled to tackle and what might be some of the things that you decide I need to outsource and need to have staff involved. So from that, our, our fourth and final worksheet, and Jeff, I'd love to get your, your, your feedback on this, is we've got a very fancy strategy. We call it a none, some, most, or all. What does that mean? As you look at all these activities that are listed out, there might be some that you say like, I should never be doing that activity. Like none of my clients get that. I clearly need to outsource that all the way to some that you really need to, you're compelled to do them almost all the time. But Jeff, I'm, I'm curious from your standpoint of what would be your take of what do you, what you would identify as the things that most advisors really should think about doing most or for all of their clients, but maybe even kind of sound off where you think our packet plug in a couple of holes. Well, the items that are typically going to be in that self category are going to have to do the most critical ones are going to be with sales and maybe even a little bit of uh, client relationship with your most important, most profitable, your most whatever clients that are critical to the survival and the flourishing of your practice. And that's where the, the few individuals who I have worked with in my years who have really just hit that elite level, they are brutal in not spending any time that is not getting new business in the door or making sure that their top clients are happy. And uh, everything else is either going to be on the team and or their outside partners. And a critical component to making that work is setting that expectation up front during the sales process, because the last thing you want to do is spend all your time getting your client to love you and you're selling you and the client buys you. And then you say, oh, and uh, thanks for your business. My team here is gonna be taking care of you from here on out. So setting that expectation that my team is gonna be able to do this and we are gonna take care of you in our process. And yeah, I may be a pretty face, but uh, and I'll be involved when I need to be, but we've got a great support system that is going to be able to uh to support your needs moving forward and of course the the investment analysis is uh, all the things that folks buy into rpag and join rpag for uh, the the items that are can be done by a machine or that we can build templates for you find six uh, a formula for success that can be duplicated within your organization, your efforts, and then the items that a group like CUNA can help take care of, which is the um, the actual 
the governance, the, the logistics that go into setting up a plan and even on the prospecting side. Yeah, I'll kind of add too, if I just did some quick analysis here, is that I could actually come to this investment category and say, you know what, I'm just not going to get involved with that, you know, because I have a partner in RPAG over here that really can knock out these things for me. Now, now there could be a, a, an, a, an occasion where someone will say, well, that's part of my value add. Uh, but are you really doing it that much better than being able to, for a couple of basis points, you know, have a have a layer put in? You know, in, in this whole approach, something as such as education, maybe say I'm only going to do the education for my my top clients and for everyone else I'm going to outsource. So that might be a situation to say, I'm only going to be doing that some of the time going forward. I cannot afford to go to Sal's Pizza Shop you know, during lunch hour or mid afternoon to do it. But that might be an example. I'm just going to put CUNY Mutual Group. We're saying I'm going to really kind of form a partnership specifically with a, the vendors education departments to have them do some heavy lifting. So again, well, secondary. Is, sorry, yeah. go ahead. Oh, no, go ahead. Go ahead. Well, there's secondary benefits to the RPG relationship as well, because there are groups out there that perform services that we don't perform, but we've gone to and we've negotiated discounted rates for our RPAG members, whether that's social media appointment setting, there's uh, a number of areas there that you would want to outsource those, but you can do that for either uh, less expensive or get more services for the same amount of money just because of the, the RPAG membership. Very good. Now we're going to get to the, the road to profitability in a second, but I, I, I'm going to really just uh, touch upon um, pillar development, we discussed a little bit about, um, you know, the index card business plan, Brian Margolis. And there's really one question that really stands out to me, and it's the very first one. And that's, what's the one thing I already know how to do effectively that if I did more of would have the biggest impact on my business? And sometimes I like to put in another word in there saying a disproportionate positive impact. All right. So it's going to be a little bit different for everyone, but hopefully you've given me you some thoughts of, Hey, what are those things that are impact? And maybe there's something you're good at, but it's really not driving revenue. And if there's anything from a planning standpoint to think about, it's just how you can kind of change the practice for greater efficiency and more revenue. Now, with that all aside, um, we want something to talk about, and that's your existing uh, clients. And it, it's one thing to so say, I'm going to do this going forward. Going forward, I'm going to be charged. I'm going to aim for the 300. I'm going to be aiming for the 10,000 minimum, but what the heck do I do about these plans that I have right now? And, and for that, we've actually put together a quadrant. And Jeff, I'm going to just walk through and have you comment on these. I got them all, all set up to go. We got, we got time on the vertical and we have revenue on the horizontal. All right. So here's the very first one, which is low revenue, low time. What, do, what are you thinking about this one, Jeff? Well, these are probably clients that have been referred to you that you otherwise may not have proactively gone after and you have set your whatever their minimum if it is a minimum fee that you're going to be instilling with them or even if it is a uh, uh, a, a basis point format maybe they are very profitable if you're part of a diversified practice they may be very profitable on the wealth management side or the benefit side. And that other group had come to you and said, Hey, we need Randy, we need, I know this isn't a plan that you'd go after, but uh, we need you to take care of them because they're a list on our side. And in that case, you figure out how to do it uh, where you can maybe stick with your $300 an hour, but how do you bump up that revenue? I'm going to give you my my dream quadrant. This is my south east quadrant. It means I'm getting a lot of revenue and I'm not spending a lot of time. This is like the dream quadrant, right? What what, do you, what are your thoughts here? Danger, Will Robbins. Danger. <laughs> what happens when a competitor comes in and says, "Jeff, he's only doing all of this for you, and he's charging you that man? We can do all of that plus some, and we're going to charge you less." Yeah, so there we got some services that could be added value that needs to be added, clearly something more. Hey, th this is kind of an interesting one, which is kind of the, uh, the, the I'm spending a lot of time, but I'm, I'm getting compensated fairly. What are your thoughts here? One of the biggest things that I, I always preach to our advisors is to make sure the client knows what you're doing for them. 
we are uh, we fall into the trap of trying to make it look easy and we're doing all this hard work time consuming effort <clears throat> behind the scenes and never let them see a sweat we're just making it look like ah it's no big deal i i like to say that's okay 361 62 days a, a year but three or four days a year, you make sure that client knows how much work you're putting into it. Because if they think it's not a big deal, they're not, they may not think that it's that valuable. And economics, anybody been in economics class in, uh, in college, they say that to that which no price is assigned, no value is assigned by the customer. So make sure that they understand what you're up to and, and everything you're doing for them. Now I got a problem quadrant. And I got nothing but question marks around this one. It's like, uh, what do we do when we're spending too much time relative to revenue? And uh, I, I got a whole list on this one. You want to kind of get us started here and I'll kind of uh, finish us off? Well, <clears throat> you only have a certain amount of levers that you can work. You can either raise the price or you can lower the service or you can have a conversation. Um, there's <clears throat> the most creative approach to this that I've ever heard is one of our uh, advisors a few years ago said that at their Christmas party every year, they have two or three nominations of clients to fire and the employees get to vote on it. And they absolutely love that part of the Christmas party. That's a really twist, twisted holiday party, if you ask me. <laughs> well, who on this right, client though. does, okay, I would challenge anybody on this uh, phone call who can did not immediately think of a client name when I told that story? Go ahead and uh, and hit me in the chat if you just love all your clients and there's not any that you that came to mind when I mentioned that. So by the way, I'm going to pop back here real quick because the whole process behind this exercise we're going through right now for you is an eight half by eleven piece of paper. Put the two quadrants in and actually start physically putting the names of of plan sponsor clients into these four categories. Right into Jeff's point. Yeah, there could be one one or two years saying, like, it's time to cut bait on this one. Um, it might be time to uh, reprice it. Uh, I'm going to throw you just one or two other ideas. I've got this idea called the Hail Mary. And the, the whole point behind this is uh, a plan that's of poor plan health, right? The participant uh, rate is not high. Uh, they're not saving enough. There, there are several reasons why a plan is failing. And Hail Mary is simply saying... I'm failing you. You're failing me. Let's put in all of the stops to see if we can turn this thing around. Now we're talking about auto enroll, auto re enroll, auto escalate, maybe some type of a different match formula that's going to be, and just simply say, we, we've got to turn this thing around and let's give it a year and we'll see where we go from there. Now, I've also put down vendor search. And the reason that I put that down is quite often, if you go back to why a, a, a particular provider was selected, Maybe they were lowest cost. And now three, four, five years have gone by. And it's it's come uh, and no surprise the advisor that they're doing all the heavy lifting because it's just a discount offering. There's not a lot of uh, value add being given. Maybe it's time to do a vendor search. And not, I'm not saying always oh, going to come to Keen Mutual Group, but certainly from the standpoint of are you, are you getting fair value for your dollar? Maybe, but is enough being done? So anyways, there's just a couple of thoughts. Um, we've really ran through some good ideas. Obviously, you can just try to do everything yourself. That's a solution that's going to be like the definition of insanity. All right, Randy, any final thoughts? Well, I'd, I'd just say that this is this is all a journey. Hopefully, we've given you a couple of ideas. Uh, we did mention that we have at, at Kini Mutual Group, we, we do have some good profitability worksheets that we can help you work through. We also have quite a bit on... We call it time management, but it's more of a focus management. Uh, you know, so we certainly uh, encourage you to reach out to your your regional wholesaler. Not only we have some good product solution, but we really have some things to help you with your practice. So I'll leave it to you to open, Jeff. But I really appreciate the time us sharing today. Well, we thank you for the partnership, Randy. I just if I tried to count, I don't think I would be able to count all of the uh, the advisors and practices who have been benefited from. Uh, yours and CUNA's partnership with RPAG over the years. You've got great stuff. Uh, thank you for that. And we will look forward to seeing everybody down the road. If you have any questions and you can't get my email address for whatever reason, support at rpag.com is your one email shop. No matter what you need from us, it'll 
send, shoot an email to that address and it will make its way to the correct party. And with that, we will thank everybody for your membership, for your time, for your partnership. And I hope to see you in person at some point uh, coming up at one of our regional summits or at the Napa Summit that will be coming up shortly. Thanks a lot. Have a great day. See you later. Thank <laughs> you.